Okay, I should have known that if we had a large contingent of Stanford GSB alumni and a lot of Brazilians, it would be hard to get everyone to sit down and stop talking. Uh, great to see everyone. I'm John Levin. I'm the dean of the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And I'd like to welcome you to the 2023 Excellence in Leadership Award Dinner. It's a real pleasure to see all of you here and to be here in New York with you. I'd especially like to offer a very warm welcome to this evening's honoree, Carlos Brito. And Brito's family, his wife Belinda is here along with their children, Mark and Luis. And we're very grateful tonight to have Brito's parents, Nazareth and Carlos, who've made the trip from Sao Paulo. And Brito's siblings, Elisa and Jose and Pedro, thank you for being here. And I also want to thank tonight's, our sponsors and the many friends and colleagues and classmates who are here to celebrate uh, Brito with us tonight. Um, we're going to have the program uh, after dinner. So for the moment, I just ask you to enjoy dinner, enjoy each other's company, and we'll pick up the program at dessert. Okay, good evening again. Great, well, welcome again, and uh, I hope everyone enjoyed dinner and uh, the chance to catch up with each other. Um, before we recognize Brito, I wanna take a few minutes just to share with you the history of this, uh, this dinner and the award and how it fits in with the, the mission of the, of the GSB. Um, and then introduce uh, Brito's introducer. <laughs> so I'll be brief. Um, so the Excellence in Leadership Award, which we're bestowing on, on Brito tonight, was established in 20 years ago, in 2003. With, and with the purpose of highlighting the achievements of a GSB alumnus or alumna who has made significant contributions to the corporate world, to society, and to the school. Of course, a central mission of the GSB is to educate innovative and principled leaders and people who uh, exemplify that both in their professional careers and in their broader lives. And today, perhaps more than ever, this is the reason that students come to the GSB from all around the world. They come so they can learn to think strategically and analytically from first principles. They come to develop the skills they need to lead teams and organizations, to ability to listen and to learn and to uh, communicate and inspire. And hopefully they leave embodying a set of values that we would like to see in our alumni integrity, a concern for others, uh, an open mind. And that ethos of leadership could not be more important in today's world. When I think about today what our students are going to go out and tackle, they are going to have to tackle so many different changes in the world, changes in technology and in globalization and the need to create broader opportunities here and around the globe. And those are the issues that we're preparing our students today to address so they can be effective leaders in the year to come. And those are the, exactly the, the things that, um, that we think about in our education. On Friday of last week, we, we, we just welcomed our MBA class. And I thought before I introduce Rita's introducer, I would just tell you a little bit about who these students are who are coming to the GP. By the way, how many people do we have in the audience who are current students that just, I know we have at least a few. Yeah. Yay, okay, we have a small, <laughs> great. So I think the bar has even gone up from last year. Um, so uh, <laughs> so, um, 
So the students we welcomed, we welcomed 433 students on Friday. And I'll just tell you about them. Um, so they're academically excellent. The average GPA of the students that we welcomed to the GSB on Friday um, in college was 3.8. Um, they have an average GMAT score of 738. 17% of the students who arrived at the school have an advanced degree, and another 20% will get a second degree uh, at Stanford. None of us would get in today to the GSB. <laughs> the, the students are diverse in every sense of the word. They, they come from 55 countries, the incoming class. They speak 53 languages of these 400 students. 46% of them are women. 36% of them international, with international being, that's their, their first country of citizenship is outside the US. Another 10% are US citizens with a second passport, so almost half of them are international. Um, more than 10%, 11% of them are the first person in their family to go to college, their first generation college students. Um, of the U.S. population, about half of them are people of color, mirroring the national population. And these students have accomplished a lot. They are the rising stars in finance and in tech. Some of them have been officers. Five percent of them have been in the military from all around the world. One of our incoming students this year is blind. And he was the first uh, blind analyst at McKinsey. As an analyst at McKinsey, Bob Sternfels, the managing partner, asked him to serve on a task force with um, other senior leaders at McKinsey to think about how the firm could better serve employees with disabilities. Another one was a performing artist who toured as the opening act for the Jonas Brothers <laughs> before coming to the GSB. By the way, the G the, for those of you who aren't GSB, there's an annual student show in the spring for musical performances and all that, this year's GSB show is going to be all time. <laughs> Why, what brings all of those people together to come and study at the GSB? The thing that brings them all together is because all of the people who arrive, they all aspire to make a difference in the world. They all aspire to be able to bring people together, to solve hard problems, to, as we say, change lives and organizations and the world. And they all aspire to the ethos of leadership that the school you know, wants them to have. And that really makes me especially proud to, first of all, to see all of the alumni in the audience tonight, but even more to be able to honor Brito tonight. Because Brito, in so many ways, just exemplifies exactly the characteristics that we're hoping that our students and then our graduates and then our alumni will have as they go out through their, through their lives. Some of you, many of you probably know Brito's story, and we're probably going to hear a little more about it tonight, to coming to the GSB on a scholarship, returning to Brazil to work for George Paulo Lehman, rising to become a CEO, and then building the world's largest brewing company at AB InBev, a job in which he had to unify hundreds of thousands of employees from just about every country on the entire planet, and to steward some of the, the most beloved brands uh, uh, anywhere on earth. So I got to know Brito shortly after I became dean through his participation in the GSB Advisory Council. And um, he, in that group, his insight and his thoughtfulness and his energy and his optimism just set an example for everybody in that, in that group. And then during COVID, I had a great experience with Brito where I had formed a task force to help me think through what to me felt like a sea change that had happened in business for business leaders and companies around societal challenges that were not being addressed by public policy, climate change and effects of new technology, creation of broader economic opportunity, and what that meant for education at the GSB. And I asked Breeder to join that task force. And we met all through the COVID pandemic on Zoom. And I will tell you that amazingly, Brito is the one person I know that can channel positive energy through a video conference. <laughs> and he was tremendously influential in that group. That, that, those discussions gave rise to our current Business Government and Society initiative, which has included a major push in sustainability and 
uh, with the new Stanford Door School and a similar effort this year on AI and a real focus at the GSB to foster discussion and debate on politically challenging topics that confront corporations. Rita made many observations and, and contributions to that group, but I'll just finish with one that he made. He reminded everyone in that group, one of the things that he said many times as we went through that process, he reminded everyone that organizations, that corporations in, in this country and everywhere depend on all of society and on the government to give them the freedom to operate and the autonomy to operate and that there's a social contract that governs business in the same way that it governs, in a different way, but in an in a analogous way to governs politics. And with that came responsibility as a leader of a major organization. And that really stuck with everyone in that group, that sense of um, responsibility of leadership, partly because Brito said it so articulately and partly because he modeled it so powerfully. And um, Brito, it's just really an honor to have you here and get the chance to, to honor someone that I admire so much and that so many of us uh, admire. Congratulations. Okay, and now I actually am gonna introduce the introducer. Uh, Robert Ottenstein is GSB alum and Brito's GSB classmate. He is now Senior Managing Director and Head of Global Beverages and Household Products Team at Evercore. Uh, and before joining Evercore, Robert headed Investor Relations for Anheuser-Busch InBev um, after InBev bought uh, Anheuser-Busch. And so he's not only Brito's classmate, but he's his colleague and friend. And please join me in welcoming Robert Ottenstein to the stage. Good evening, I'm thrilled to be here. In my experience, there are two types of CEOs. Those who talk to you with one eye looking over your shoulder, right, you know, to see if there's somebody more important to talk to. And you know, you know the type, right? And uh, very, very rigorous empirical research suggests that they probably went to an elite East Coast business school. <laughs> <laughs> then there's the other type. Brito is the other type. He is fully present. When he speaks to you, you feel like you are the only person in the room. Tonight, we honor Carlos Brito, and I would also like to honor his friend and wife of over 30 years, Belinda. <laughs> Brito's accomplishments at AB InBev, won him a position as Barron's top 30 global CEO rankings for many years. And that's global, that's not just US, that's the world, it's amazing, okay? The numbers, the numbers are so stunning, I literally had to check them twice. And that's my job, I'm an analyst, I still had to check them twice. <laughs> the story started with a $50 million acquisition of Brahma, 1989 relatively chump change these days. When Brito became CEO in 2005, its market cap was 26 billion, not bad. At its peak, AB InBev's market cap exceeded 200 billion, 26 billion to 200 billion, that's value creation. But let me frame this in a, a more tangible perspective. In less than 30 years, Brito and his team created a company that stood shoulder to shoulder with Coca-Cola and Pepsi, companies that were over 100 years in the making. Unbelievable. We met in 1987 at the GSB, both strangers in a strange land. I was an East Coast liberal arts major, Brito a mechanical engineer from Brazil. If there were any clues to Brito's later success, I missed him, I gotta be honest. Uh, <laughs> he, 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 he was low key. He was organized, he, he, he was a great, great team player, he was fun to work with, but, but CEO, Re really? <laughs> After graduation, Brito started work with Giorgio Paolo Lehman and his partners on the acquisition of the Brahma Beer Company in Brazil. 
We saw each other through the years, always seemingly in a different city, but most notably at his amazing wedding to Belinda in Rio in 1993. In 2004, Brahma, now Ambev, and get used to these different names here, merged with the Belgian brewer Interbrew to form InBev. At the time, Bruto ran Brazil for Ambev. By the end of 2005, he headed the largest beer company in the world. Brito quickly set the tone for dramatic cultural change at the new combined company. One day, driving to work, he saw that the Interbrew executives had reserved parking spots. Brito was annoyed, and, and trust me, you do not want to get Brito annoyed. <laughs> he declared that, what, what the heck, these, these spots should go to whoever drive, arrives first. This is crazy, giving his new colleagues a loud, we're not in Kansas anymore, wake-up call. Of course, the big deal came in 2008 when Brito led the contentious acquisition of Anheuser-Busch. Antonio Weiss, who I believe is here tonight, he headed the Lazard team and told me how impressed he was with Brito's use of humor to diffuse tense situations, like the first face-to-face -face meeting between the management teams after months of highly publicized negotiations that became the subject of a book, Dethroning the King. So, Brito had already done something to get a book written about him. So imagine the following. Two sides come into the conference room, right? They sit down on either opposing sides. And this is after months and months of very contentious negotiations. It's in the press. It's all over the place. This was an iconic company, right? The tension is as thick as the humidity of a St. Louis summer. That's thick, OK? Brito calmly walks in praises the work of the Anheuser-Busch team, thanks them for coming to the table, and this casually remarks, and eh, you know, all you need was a little nudge to come to the table. That understated humor broke the ice and everybody laughed. Everybody who I've spoke to about the deal was incredibly impressed with Brito's knowledge of even the smallest details and his steady composure. Steve Lippin, his PR advisor from Brunswick, remarked that the only time that Brito really got him nervous was when he was set to appear in front of the United States Congress to defend the deal. I, I would be nervous too. Anybody would be nervous. But what Lippin was nervous about wasn't so much what Brito might say, but what Brito might wear. <laughs> he had never seen Brito in a tie before, and he wasn't even sure if he owned one. In 2009, through the power of the Stanford Alumni Network, I found myself headed to Belgium to join Brito's team. I literally saw Brito at work and became part of a company unlike any I had ever imagined. He had no desk. He worked around a large table with his direct reports and shared one admin with a CFO. But most importantly, his team was composed of some of the most talented people I have ever had the privilege to work with. And not only were they talented, but they were great people who you wanted to go out and have a beer with. And we had many. Over time, two aspects of his leadership style stood out. First, CEO as role model. He did what he asked others to do. He usually traveled in coach and stayed at the same modest hotels as other employees. In fact, even occasionally he bunked with them notably on a trip to China when the hotel was short a room. I hear he wasn't too bad a snore, but that's <laughs> another story. Second, CEO is clockmaker. As Jim Collins, the Stanford management guru notes, Brito was a clockmaker, not just a time teller. He put in place, championed, and enforced habits and processes to drive ever higher levels of performance. When Brito announced his departure in 2021, I was shocked. After all, his father, who's with us tonight, and his mother, uh, had worked till he was 86. But for ABI to continue to prosper, it had to make room for the next generation. Many of Brito's former colleagues, business partners, and friends helped me put together the material that we have tonight. Thank you all. I really appreciate your help. I don't have time to tell you all the impressive adjectives they use to describe Brito, but 
They paint a picture of someone you want to have in the foxhole with you, both in business and in life. My final story. Like today, the UN was in session. Midtown traffic was at a standstill. That afternoon, Brito had to be in the TV studio at 30 Rock and then cross town for a speech at the UN. So what do you do? I'll tell you what Brito did. He arrives at the office with a city bike and a helmet under his arm. <laughs> with Brito, failure is simply not an option. At the last moment, the traffic clears and New York, and New York City misses watching one of the world's greatest CEOs riding a bike to the UN in a suit and tie. I'm now very, very honored to hand the mic over to Carlos Brito. Well, thank you, Dean Levin, for the kind words. And thank you, Robert, for that introduction. A bit skewed, <laughs> but still, you know, hit the mark. But thank you very much, Fred. Robert, Robert's a great friend. Tonight is about leadership. And the most important thing anyone can do as a leader is to choose the people on their team, which means that the most important thing I ever did was convince my wife, Belinda, to choose me. <laughs> She's here tonight. So are my parents, my brother, my sister, and two of our children, Mark and Louise, who is actually about to start her second year at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. <clears throat> Our daughter Christine and our son Kevin couldn't be here tonight, but we still love them anyway. <laughs> Along with my family, I see some of my colleagues from Belron over there. Even if you don't know Belron, you probably know our US company, Safe Light. Safe Light Repair, Safe Light Replace. <laughs> And if, and if you think our jingles have ever been stuck in your head, you're not alone. <laughs> I also see former colleagues from AB and Bev and so many friends who have become part of our lives. Thank you all for coming. Accepting this award tonight, I feel honored, I feel humbled, but more than that, I feel blessed. In many ways, what made so many of those blessings possible was studying at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And tonight, I want to share just a few of, the, few of the things I've learned since I was admitted to the GSB class of 1989. I still remember that moment like it was yesterday. Back in the 1980s, it was common knowledge among Brazilians aspiring to pursue an MBA in the US, like me, that the GSB took just one Brazilian per year. I didn't think I had a chance. But one day, my mom called me at work about a cable that had arrived. It was signed by Bruce Payton, the Dean of Admissions, and it had big news. For the class of 1989, I was the Brazilian. <laughs> it was one of the proudest, most exciting moments of my life. There was just one problem. I could not afford to go. My only real chance lay with a Brazilian businessman, Jorge Paulo Lemon, as I mentioned before, who I knew sometimes gave loans to junior partners at his investment bank who were hoping to get MBAs abroad. And the problem was I didn't work at his bank. <laughs> My closest connection to him was the uncle of a friend of a friend. But somehow I was able to get a meeting with him. To my astonishment, he agreed to give me a full scholarship for my, for my first year. 
I said, Jorge, I won't, be able, I won't be able to pay you back anytime soon. No, no, he replied. I don't want you to pay me back. He told me he wanted just three things. First, that I keep him informed about my classes. Second, that I help someone one day uh, the way he was helping me. And finally, he said, before you accept any full-time job offer, come talk to me. A few weeks later, I arrived in Palo Alto. Up until that point, I had spent my career as an engineer. So my professors at the GSB taught me about everything, from finance to marketing to accounting. Even more important was what I learned just being surrounded by so many talented people from all over the world. Like many students at the GSP, in high school, my undergrad, I was at the top of my class. And now, suddenly, I was average. At first, I'll admit, it was kind of upsetting. I started to worry. What happened to me? But after the first quarter, I stopped being intimidated and became inspired. The bar was higher. That pushed me to raise my own bar, my own bar higher as well. It gave me the confidence I could operate in a more international setting and potentially be successful outside of Brazil. Like most GSB students, I graduated with multiple job offers in the US and Europe. But as I had promised, I keep in touch with Jorge and I went to see him before I accepted a job. He made me an offer on his own. Move back to Brazil to work for his bank and take a pay cut of 80% compared to my best offer. <laughs> I think my dad almost had a heart attack <laughs> when I told him I had accepted. But Jorge had bet on me, so I decided to bet on him. It was one of the best decisions of my life, and not just because the bank is where I met Belinda. Just a few months later, after I moved back home, Jorge and his partners acquired a controlling stake in a Brazilian brewery called Brahma. One of those partners, Marcel Telles, who is here tonight, became the CEO, and he started to join. He asked me to join his team as a financial analyst. I would remain at that company for the next 32 years. It's where I would learn from many great leaders like him and where I would become a leader myself. It's also where I would come to believe that while leadership is endlessly complicated, its fundamentals are simple. I think of them as dream, people, culture. Let's start with dream. When I joined Brahma, we were only present in Brazil. Yet from the very beginning, we had a clear objective of building a best-in-class international company. It was a big dream, and we were not afraid to say it out loud and weave it into every part of our business. As we used to say, a big, a big dream takes just as much work as a small dream. At first, we wanted to expand throughout South America, then to multiple continents, then around the world. As we grew, so did our dreams. More than that, as Brahma became the company that today is AB InBev, I learned that a big dream can just be something you say. It has to be backed by what you do. Dreams have consequences. Here's just one example. In our company's early days, we made sure that we always hired a higher number of talented people than we needed to outsiders that might have seemed unnecessary or even wasteful. But we wanted to be a best-in-class global company, and that meant building a bunch of future leaders who would be ready to step into important roles as we grew. Not everyone likes working in a company with a big dream. It requires more commitment, more time, more emotional investment, but the people who like it love it. Talented people are not just looking to build something average. They want to be part of a big idea, a big dream, and to be able to look back and say, I'm proud of what we built. I'm proud I was part of that thing. 
And that brings me to the second element of leadership, people. You can only dream big and have your dream come true if you have great people on your team. At the end of the day, any company is no more and no less than its people. We are the company. If we grow as a group, so does our company. If we are excited about something, so is the company. It is not what they decide, what they tell us to do, because there is no they. It's what we decide and what we do. There is only us. In fact, over the years, I've come to believe that great people are the only sustainable competitive advantage for any company or organization, and they are constantly in short supply, which means people must come first, always. Leaders need to make time for people throughout the organization, from recruiting, to coaching, to mentoring, to motivating and inspiring their teams. If leaders don't have time for people, something is very wrong with their priorities. Building teams of great people is not just a job for the HR department. It's everybody's job and everybody's responsibility. In retaining great people in particular, by allowing them to progress their careers at the speed of their talent must be a constant focus. At the same time, if you're a group of great people but they are all moving in different directions, that's not a team, it's just a bunch. And that's where the third element of leadership, culture, comes in. For more than 30 years, first at AB and Bev and now at Belron, I have been lucky to be part of companies committed to building true cultures of excellence. I remember that from the very beginning at Brahma, our culture made us a place where people were not afraid to identify gaps, to recognize the difference between where we were and where we wanted to be. In fact, people sought to open new gaps so that they could work hard, close those gaps, and then open the next ones. It was a culture of constantly raising the bar. It was also a culture of ownership. It's like when you drive your own car versus driving a rental. Hopefully you drive safely either way, but you don't wash the rental car. You don't get an oil change. It's an identical car, but the attitude is different. You make better decisions when the car is yours. It's the same in business. You make better decisions when it's your company, your money, your dream. You balance the long and the short term, and you're resilient in the face of challenges. That's why it's important for leaders to create an environment where people feel and behave as if they own the, their company. A place where people are empowered and allowed to run their own departments with freedom and with the accountability that comes with it. Where people are heard and participate in problem solving and can challenge ideas with no fear of hierarchy. And where people share the value they create. Having owners as opposed to just employees or executives, makes a world of difference. Dreaming big, putting people first, creating a culture of excellence and ownership, these elements of leadership are as crucial today as they were 30 years ago. But there's another element of leadership that I've really only begun to recognize and to think about deeply in the last decade or so. And that's what I would like to end with tonight. 13 years ago, at a town hall with around 200 global trainees, I was taking questions when a young woman from Ukraine, as it happens, raises her hand. Here's my question, she said. What would the world miss if our company didn't exist? What would the world miss if our company didn't exist? That question made me and my team reflect deeply about what it really means to do things the right way. Today's talented people, the kind of people who make companies great, want to be part of a company that not only grows and makes money, but that they feel makes the world a better place. A company regarded by the community as being part of the solution, not part of the problem. Today's customers want to buy products and services from companies that minimize their impact on our environment and leave companies better off. This is why I've come to believe that today, part of the job of any business leader is to create a company the world would truly miss. That's not easy to do. Anyone can sell products and services, but to do so in a way 
where you become not just beneficial, but indispensable to your customers and help solve the problems they care most about. That's where every company should aspire to. This means we cannot just choose to make our shareholders better off. We need to think about the impacts of our decisions on our people, on our customers, and on the communities where we operate. Not every decision will make every stakeholder happy, but we, would, we should have all of them in mind when managing our businesses. In these days, with more transparency, more public scrutiny, and more stakeholders, it's not enough to talk about doing things differently. Companies have to back up their words with actions. Here are just two examples. AB InBev works with thousands of small farmers around the world, not just the big ones, offering these small farmers access to technologies and markets they otherwise would not have. Belron recycles windshields, millions of them every year, rather than sending those windshields to landfills. Working with small farmers takes time and effort. And, and as it happens, glass used in the windshields is very expensive to recycle. So in the short term, these types of initiatives cost money. But when you do things the right way, it makes people feel proud to be part of your company. It makes customers feel good about working with your company because they know that you care. In other words, this kind of actions are not only the right thing to do, but also good for business. We can't choose between pursuing growth for our companies or making sure communities benefit as we grow. We have to do both. The world has changed. The business world must change with it. And the business schools must change as well, which is another reason I'm proud to be an alum of the GSB. The Stanford Graduate School of Business has both the ability and the credibility to study the interaction of business with all stakeholders, not just shareholders, to evolve the teaching of business, to modernize the MBA curriculum, and reflect the world in which we live and operate today. As I look toward the future, one of the things I'm most excited about is an initiative Dean Levin launched at the GSB called Business, Government, and Society. I'm excited and honored to be one of the contributors to this new program which is helping to reimagine the role of business schools and business leaders in the coming decades. We have the opportunity to create a better environment in which to do business, while also ensuring that as companies succeed, communities succeed as well. In other words, the GSB is dreaming bigger than ever. And in the days, months, and years to come, I'm excited to work with so many of you in this room as we make those big dreams a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Brito, and you can see how Brito was able to bring together 200 or more thousand people who work for him, because what an amazing speaker and person you are, Brito. That was spectacular. Um, I wanna, that's the, that is the end of our program, but I just want to say, again, um, you know, what a pleasure to be here. It's so, you know, it really, it's so much fun to see all of Brito's friends and colleagues and so many people from the school here tonight and to bring everyone together. And you're welcome to take as much time as you want, uh, continuing to chat and uh, finish dessert. And thank you all. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.